آه السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته آه اسمحوا لي قبل أن نبدأ هذا السيمينار أن نترحم على جميع شهداء الواجب في مجال, في مجال الحقل الصحي أينما كانوا آه خلال وباء فيروس الكورونا المستجد آه وأخص بالذكر آه مستر عادل الطيار مستر أمجد الحوراني والزميل حافظ آه جلال لهم جميعا الرحمة والمغفرة بإذن تعالى آه مرحب بجميع أنا سارة إبراهيم حسن عبد الجليل آه استشارية أطفال آه بالمملكة المتحدة آه برحب بالجميع آه في آه أول آه ويبنار فيما يختص فايتنج كوفيد آه 19 آه فحنتقل ناو آه فور دي سلايد Our theme uh, for today, uh, Sudanese doctors abroad stand united supporting colleagues and health professionals in Sudan in our fight uh, against the corona pandemic. This is a collective work which is organized by the following groups, uh, Sudan Doctors U uh, Union UK, Sudan Doctors Union um, in Ireland, Sudan Doctors Union Canada, Sudan Doctor Sudanese Australian Medical Professionals Association, Uh, Sudanese Doctors Association in Qatar, uh, Sudanese American Physician Association. We are honored to have a very distinguished speaker who are Dr. Majda Muhammad Ahmed Ali, uh, Dr. Abu Abayd Hamour, Dr. Hussam Osman, Dr. Ibrahim Fawzi, Dr. Suhail Jamal. As well, we are very grateful to ASSET, which is a group of Sudanese engineers and ICT professionals decided to gather together and work on a voluntary project that benefits the members and the wider Sudanese community in Ireland who are providing the technical support today. Just a few housekeeping points. Uh, we have four presentations. They will be de delivered. In the meantime, uh, if you have any question, please type it in the chat box. Uh, you write your name. Where are you based? Who uh, would you like uh, the message to be addressed to? The uh, Q&A session will start after the four, um, the, the four presentations. The, moder the moderators will read out each message and will try uh, our best to read out all questions if possible. It depends on time, obviously. Um, during the webinar, your microphone will be muted, as well as the video. Okay. And that reduces the interruption in view of the potential internet challenges. This is the first tester for us as a group, and so please accept our apology in advance and any difficulties. Um, please bear with us. Before we start, uh, I would like to introduce our moderators today Dr. Shaza Taha, Family Medicine Academic Office, SU UK, Dr. Mohammed Jamal, uh, Chest Physician, uh, Media Office, SU UK. And now uh, I will move swiftly to introduce the first speaker, if that's possible. So uh, we are very grateful uh, for Dr. Majda Muhammad Ahmed Ali, uh, who will speak about global health uh, challenges and COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Majda Ali is well known uh, to the majority of us. For those who, few who don't know Dr. Majda, She is a founding member of Al-Manar Women NGO, which uh, was established in 1991, and secre secretary of POD. Dr. Majda is a community physician, and she was the director of the National CBD program in the Ministry of Health during 1984-1989. She has been a consultant and facilitator to several NGOs, and co-founder to a number of civil societies and organizations. She has submitted several conference papers and studies on many public health issues. Ipadda, Dr. Majda. Assalamu alaikum. One, two, slide one. Uh, the SARS no The SARS novel coronavirus was first detected in China in late 2019. Its subsequent exponential spread and the declaration of the COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in high mortality rates, overwhelming health systems, weakening economies, and initiating geopolitical change. Even before the pandemic, 
there were huge challenges facing the world. Climate change, political instability, local conflicts, escalating humanitarian emergencies, pollution, epidemics and infectious disease, misuse of resources in relation to health, and soaring food prices. However, these interrelated issues that have a devastating effect on health and well-being were not addressed. Consequently, the health systems faced shifting democratic trends, changing food habits, increasing expenditure on unhealthy products, leading to epidemiological shifts towards chronic non-communicable disease. This move focused production of innovative medicines and health technologies that were highly priced, challenging the sustainability of health systems. The health sector became a money-spinning sector with considerable return on investment, accounting for nearly 20% of the GDP in developed and industrial countries. As a result, there was a gradual shift towards curative health care with dwindling public health institutions delivering basic health care and public health activities. Unfortunately, the very public health sector institutions that are set to overcome the very crisis that the world is facing now were eroded. Next. Global health, health global healthcare delivery systems are being developed in a way that is bringing about both helpful advances and ethical challenges. Inequality in terms of both healthcare access and utilization continues to be a global concern. The challenge of fulfilling health as a human right defined as, next please, the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health is one of the fundamental rights of every human being without distinction of race, religion, political belief, economic or social condition. This definition needs to be endorsed in the face of future disasters to which the world is prone given the fragility of globalized economy. To address future disasters, the main focus should be on health and food security and socio-economic conditions that can relieve financial debt. Hence, a suggested approach for health, economic and financial responses informed by the Sustainable Development Goals could be the following. First, understand that this great global crisis is unprecedented and we must continue to sustain the support to the health sector after the crisis. Revi by reviving primary health care and universal health co coverage to fulfill SDG 3. Invest in education, knowledge and human capital in the age of digitalization to ensure quality education as outlined in SDG 4. Focus economic stimulus on the most vulnerable, vulnerable people and businesses to eliminate poverty and reduce inequality. Prioritize economic policies in full partnership with a whole nation approach with clear determination of the roles of government, community, and private sector to ensure that we are addressing the social determinants of health. Localize development and investment, and finally, accelerate digitalization. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Majda, for the precise um, uh, speech and it is um, yes uh, uh, the pandemic has exposed a lot of gaps and uh, we need to endorse health as a human right um, for um, anybody who has um, or, or not followed Dr. Amajda uh, the script of her presentation will be published on our uh, website sdu.org.uk um, now I will move to the um, second uh, speaker, Dr. Abu Abeida Hamour, Clinical Characteristics of COVID-19. Uh, Dr. Hamour uh, is a consultant physician and a clinical associate professor in uh, University Hospital of Northern Columbia, a Northern Health Medical Lead for HIV, HCV, Antimicrobial Stewardship and Infection Control Programs, Internal Medicine, Infectious Disease, Tropical International uh, Medicine, 
certificate in travel uh, health. Dr. Abu Ubaida as well is representing Sudan Doctors Union Canada. Let's hold the Dr. Abu Ubaida. Dr. Abu Ubaida. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, uh, kind uh, introduction and the invitation to participate uh, uh, in this uh, webinar. Uh, I've been tasked uh, with the uh, uh, task of presenting uh, uh, on clinical characteristics of COVID-19. If I could have the first slide, please. Could I have the first slide, please? Next, uh, the, uh, I would like to start by presenting a, uh, a case uh, that we uh, uh, recently had at our hospital of a uh, 49 years old gentleman uh, who, uh, whose wife attended a conference in Vancouver uh, uh, the week before presentation. Uh, he basically presented with a uh, short history of uh, uh, fever, dry cough, uh, and fatigue. When he was seen in, in ER, he was pyrexial, but his other vital signs were stable. His white cell count was on the low side. He was lymphopenic. CRP was elevated. The platelet count was low. And his chest X-ray showed uh, faint bilateral lower basal uh, infiltrates. A nasopharyngeal swab was collected and sent for COVID-19, influenza A, B, and RSV. As he was clinically stable, he was sent, he was given a single dose of IV ceftriaxone and sent home on azithromycin, hydroxychloroquine, and oseltamivir. He was advised to return uh, if he became um, uh, more uh, breathless or uh, uh, sicker. Next slide, please. Uh, he did return two days later with worsening dyspnea and um, at that time, uh, his um, COVID-19 uh, swab came back positive. Uh, he was uh, put in an isolation room. Uh, he was uh, uh, barely maintaining his oxygen saturation on 10 liters of oxygen. Uh, he, so he was uh, hypoxemic uh, and had to be transferred to uh, ICU for uh, further management of the hypoxic or hypoxemic respiratory failure. He was intubated and ventilated. Uh, at the time, his lab showed a normal white cell count. Uh, his platelet count was still low. His CRP was over 100, and his LDH was twice the upper limit of normal. The chest X-ray uh, showed worsening of the patchy infiltrates. If I could have the next slide to show that, please. As you can see, the X-ray showed uh, bilateral uh, basal and peripheral uh, infiltrates. Uh, next slide, please. So he was intubated for about 10 to 11 days. During his uh, stay in the ICU, the WBC count uh, gradually um, uh, recovered and um, uh, in improved, and so did the uh, lymphocyte uh, uh, fraction. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. The platelets of the, were initially low, but gradually uh, recovered and then uh, even rebounded. Uh, the, uh, this was one of the manifestations of the inflammatory response that we expect, uh, uh, platelet uh, increase or thrombocytosis after an initial period of thrombocytopenia. Next slide, please. The D-dimer was initially elevated, and this also uh, subsequently came down uh, to um, uh, normal level. 
Next slide, please. Uh, the ferritin, which is a, a, a well-recognized acute, acute phase uh, reactant, uh, was initially elevated and uh, subsequently came down. Uh, and this is one of the features of uh, the so-called cytokine uh, uh, storm that is often seen in these patients um, with elevation, marked elevation of ferritin, uh, CRP, uh, and D-dimer. Uh, this patient uh, is now on the ward. Uh, he's requiring minimal amounts of oxygen and is uh, um, uh, ready to be discharged home in a day or two. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, now I'll just go over the uh, clinical features of COVID-19 as documented in the literature. Uh, the incubation period uh, of COVID-19 uh, ranges between uh, two to seven days with a median of four uh, days, uh, but it can be up to 14 uh, days. Uh, next slide, please. These are the symptoms as um, documented uh, uh, in a, a study from uh, Wuhan, uh, China. Uh, over a thousand cases uh, were reported in the New England Journal of Medicine at the end of February. And uh, uh, the paper showed that uh, uh, the main presenting features of this disease are fever and uh, a dry cough. Um, but it's important to note that uh, in the Chinese experience, over 50% of patients did not, did not have a fever uh, at presentation. Subsequently, during that admission, up to 90% uh, of patients had a fever. But initially, uh, fever was absent. And, and this is important to remember so that we do not, uh, uh, it does not put us off the diagnosis or uh, it doesn't rule out the diagnosis of uh, COVID if the fever is absent. Um, about a third of patients may have a productive cough, but the majority uh, or two thirds have a dry cough. Uh, fatigue is a non-specific symptom that may be present in various uh, viral illnesses. So it's not specific to, to COVID. Uh, breathlessness is a late feature and should always be taken seriously because patients who, have, who are dysnic or breathless uh, need to be assessed uh, for admission because they may have pneumonia or ARDS. Diarrhea is a rare symptom and may be present in uh, less than 5% of patients. Next slide, please. Uh, others uh, less common symptoms uh, that have been reported uh, from Italy in particular um, are uh, the a loss of the sense of smell and taste. Uh, this tends to occur, or according to the Italian data, uh, it was noted uh, in about a third of patients have uh, a loss of sense of smell or taste, and both uh, in about 20% uh, of patients. Uh, other symptoms that may be seen uh, in this uh, uh, syndrome are obviously headaches, and sore throat, and rhinorrhea, and these are very non-specific and can occur with any with other other Next slide, please. Slide, please. Radiological findings uh, are uh, seen uh, in uh, about on, on a chest X-ray. Uh, abnormality is expected in. About 60% of patients, uh, but the CT may show abnormalities in over 80% of patients. Even in asymptomatic individuals, uh, there is a study that showed that asymptomatic patients who contract COVID, 50% of them may show CT abnormalities. Uh, the typical abnormality seen on CT is ground glass uh, uh, appearance. Um, and uh, the CT can be normal in uh, up to 18% uh, of patients who have non-severe pneumonia and in about 3% uh, of patients who have severe pneumonia. So even the CT can be normal. Next slide, please. Uh, I, I think I'll skip the slide in the interest of time because it just describes what I said. 
Next slide, please. Uh, this is an example of um, uh, chest X-ray uh, uh, progression uh, showing uh, increasing or worsening infiltrate that usually start basally and peripherally, and then they move to the center. And you can see these, uh, this is the initial X-ray in a Wuhan patient uh, that progressed uh, to uh, uh, more widespread uh, shadowing uh, within three days of uh, uh, the first film. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a ground, gl typical ground glass uh, uh, shadowing or uh, infiltrates that are seen in COVID. But again, these are not uh, specific and may be seen in other viral pneumonias or um, other uh, uh, pulmonary conditions. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a three-volume uh, reconstruction, again showing the uh, patchy infiltrates um, after progression uh, to involve the central parts of the lung. Next slide, please. There are some uncommon radiological uh, features that uh, are uh, that we would not expect to see in in, in, in COVID uh, patients, and these include uh, pleural effusions that are seen in only about 5% of cases, uh, masses, uh, cavitation, lymphadenopathy, these are unlikely to be present in COVID patients. And if they are, they should make us suspect uh, an alternative diagnosis. Next slide, please. The uh, typical or cardinal laboratory features of COVID-19 is lymphopenia or lymphocytopenia which is present in over 80% of cases, uh, followed by leukopenia in about a third, and uh, likewise thrombocytopenia in about a third of patients. And as we've seen in the patient that I presented earlier, CRP elevation, ferritin, D-dimer elevation, these are frequent uh, uh, findings representing the acute phase response or the inflammatory uh, reaction. Next slide, please. Uh, so the WHO uh, uh, classifies uh, uh, the uh, uh, syndrome uh, into uh, uh, various uh, uh, subtypes or syndromes. Um, the uh, commonest is going to be a mild illness or uncomplicated uh, upper respiratory tract infection with no uh, signs of respiratory distress, sepsis, or dehydration. And within this category, there may be some patients or uh, another category, maybe before this one, could be the asymptomatic uh, people. And uh, in a study from one of the cruise ships, it showed that about 20% of people who tested positive for COVID were actually asymptomatic. So maybe one in five people uh, will have no symptoms at all. And then you have uh, mild pneumonia and severe pneumonia with the kidney and uh, oxygen desaturation or hypoxemia. Uh, confusion, systolic or diastolic hypotension, uh, uh, ARDS, uh, and some patients may obviously present with uh, sepsis or severe uh, sepsis with septic shock. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is my last slide. Uh, just to illustrate uh, the factors associated with a poor outcome or uh, increased mortality uh, in COVID patients, and these are advancing age, the older uh, patients uh, the, uh, are, the, the higher the risk of mortality. Um, in, uh, in the U.S. Uh, data, we know that um, over 80% of those who died um, are above the age of 65. And in Chinese data, uh, the mortality among those above the age of 80 was about 20%. Uh, presence of comorbidities, uh, whether they're cardiac or pulmonary or other uh, diabetes or, or cancer, uh, that adds to the, the more comorbidities, the higher the mortality. And then, then the elevated uh, uh, markers that we uh, saw in our patients, like D-dimer, CRP, the troponin uh, elevation uh, indicates myocarditis or myocardial dysfunction, and likewise CK and LDH. Uh, lymphocytopenia is also a prognostic feature, uh, and so is elevation of the uh, prothrombin time uh, and uh, presence of acute kidney injury or uh, secondary infection. 
So this is just a brief overview of the uh, clinical manifestations uh, or characteristics that we might see uh, in patients with COVID uh, as um, illustrated uh, by the case uh, that I presented uh, uh, at the beginning of this presentation. And with that, I thank you very much. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Abu Reda, uh, for um, the thorough um, lot of discussion about the clinical presentation. Um, and we may come uh, back later with some questions about um, sort of the new protocols and the role of some new sort of medication uh, that people have been uh, debating. Thank you very much. Um, I will now swiftly uh, move uh, to introduce um, Dr. Hussam Osman. We are very grateful for Dr. Hussam uh, to join us today to talk about public health aspect and diagnostic challenges of COVID-19. Uh, Dr. Hussam is a consultant virologist and clinical service director in Birmingham Public Health Laboratory and uh, Birmingham Heart Hospital. Uh, welcome, uh, Hussam. Uh, Shukran, Yazidan. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'll just take the opportunity with, with my presentation to talk today about the public health issues uh, related to uh, COVID-19. And uh, uh, at the same time, uh, give talk about England as, having England as, as an example. Okay. This is very slide to just give you a timeline about the story with COVID since it was first described in the 31st of December last year and when were the first cases reported and so on. Um, and going down till present day or yesterday. And this is the, as you can see at the end, the last count of numbers in, in the United Kingdom up to yesterday. Uh, the slides will be available for people if they want to go in details about this. And so just for the interest of time, I will move on now. So this is this once since the epidemic began, and this is a story in China. As you can see, the number since uh, the beginning of the epidemic till now is slowing down significantly in China and ending at about 80,000 uh, cases in, in China. Next slide, please. So lots of a study came out after the experience in China, and they compared uh, COVID-19 to the other uh, coronaviruses, which cause uh, 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 mainly uh, pneumonia and so on. So you can see as uh, what they looked at is the productive number and the doubling time, the incubation period, and the mortality, and so on. And if you can look at this table, the reproductive number, just for people, excuse me, I will just, I know you all know this thing, just explain. The reproductive number is the number of people infected by each uh, single case. As you can see, COVID is just like SARS, uh, but more than MERS and, and, and influenza. The doubling time is how much uh, the number double each, uh, take double the numbers each uh, and each time point. Uh, uh, and as you can see, the, the COVID also is, is, is very, takes a very short time compared to MERS and SARS. And then uh, Dr. Hamoul spoke about the incubation period. And then we talk about the mortality, which is which is the big difference. That although the the virus have got uh, very infectious because of their productive number and doubling time, but the mortality compared to SARS and MERS is, is very low. SARS is 9.5, for example, made the after 34 percent, and the uh, 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 influenza is, is less than. But COVID is 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 only about, uh, 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 as you can see, up to 4 percent. Although the, the numbers are changing all the time. Next slide, please. This slide just to shows you. Uh, the, 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 the difference or the, the effect of, of, of the front viruses and the reproductive uh, 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 number with the mortalities uh, and, and this and so on. If you can see COVID diseases in the purple uh, color there is more than uh, than influenza, for example, even the, the pandemic from influenza in 57 
and 2009, uh, and that's why it has got a higher mortality than those two viruses. While, for example, if you take chickenpox, which is a very in, uh, contagious disease, has a very high uh, reproductive number, but the mortality is low. While measles, on the top corner, on the right top corner, right corner, and smallpox have very high mortality and a very high reproductive number. Next slide, please. This is the picture here in, in the United Kingdom. As you can see, the number of cases in the green, li the, the green line it shows you the care of the epidemic uh, 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 since the beginning of the, of, of, of the uh, epidemic here uh, in, in February and so on. And the one red line is, is the uh, mortality associated with, 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 with the cases so far. Uh, and the, 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 for example, these are the numbers yesterday, uh, in the morning of the 10th, which is 70,000, with 8,000 deaths. Today, for example, now, the, the mortality is, is, is nice. The, 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 the cases have jumped up to 79,000 cases, as the mortality is nearly 10,000, is 9,800 uh, uh, cases. So it is it is uh, a, a big problem now, and we are uh, having uh, big issues with this epidemic here in, in, in England. The numbers are going around doubling every day, uh, and it's putting a lot of uh, um, pressure on resources and so on. Next slide, please. This is just to compare what's happening here in the United Kingdom with France and Italy. And, uh, and Spain, who are also hit very hard with this with this uh, epidemic, as you can see, we have going in the same trajectory as Italy, Spain, and Germany, and France, and so on. While countries like South Korea are starting to the, 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 the smooth out the the, 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 the effect of the of the pandemic, uh, and so on. Next slide, please. So. With this sort of uh, epidemics or pandemic, you have to take measures to try to limit the impact of the pandemic on the on the on the on, on the side basis and on the community. So the red, for example, care is, is if you do nothing, you haven't done anything, that will happen. The care will go up and up and up, and then it will come down. But it will take a long, it will take a time, and the casualties will be very high. So the idea is to get to the blue care, which is what we say flattening the care, to tr introduce some measures to, to reduce the impact and to flatten the care so your healthcare systems can uh, uh, cope with what is going on. Next slide, please. So there are two uh, public health policies people can use to, 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 to fight the pandemic. The first one is the contain the virus, and that by what they mean is uh, identifying cases, isolating them, and then I define the contact of the cases, testing them, and, and manage them accordingly. It's less effective in flattening the care, uh, and then it may have a, a possible repercussion in, in the short term because, uh, uh, because of the limited health capacity, but it will help that people to get infected, of course, to build immunity, and may help in the long term. The other uh, policy, of course, is to, use, to try to suppress the virus or lowering the replication number of the virus, and which is what we call lockdown, so people don't go out and so on. And it will help in, uh, uh, definitely in, 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 in flattening the care, but uh, uh, the, 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 the other problem is that it, 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 the population will still become vulnerable because people are not exposed to the, to, to the virus. So you may have a second wave after that, even if you manage to flatten the care. Next slide, please. So these are views of uh, Professor Sorico and Professor Galitoli here in, in the economic uh, of London School of Business, and they were saying, whatever you do, the price is very high. So if you can't find a vaccine very early on to the, to, 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 to the, to the virus or to whatever the, the microbe is, and which is the case with, with, with COVID, I don't think you will have a vaccine very early on. Still, you will have so many casualties whatever uh, the, 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 the policy use, either containment or suppression, there will always be a very high price to pay. And that's what is currently 
uh, see, seeing now in, 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 in the United Kingdom. Next slide, please. This is an example from the big pandemic in influenza pandemic in 1918 and the response of two cities in the, in, the, in the United States of America to the pandemic. The first city was Philadelphia. The first case was reported on the 17th of September, but they didn't take much care of it. They went on with the very big citywide parade on the 28th of September. And, uh, uh, and as you can see, the care, which is, a, which is a black line, very high casualties. And a lot of people died and suffered. While in another city, which is St. Louis, the first case was on the 5th of October, and then just two days later, they immediately introduced measures to, 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 to contain the, the pandemic. And you can see on the dotted line, the effect of that was very successful in containing the, 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 the pandemic uh, at that time. Next slide, please. This is, then again, another example of uh, the response of two countries to the pandemic. One of them is South Korea, as you can see in the green li line down there, and Italy. So South Korea was very aggressive in, 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 in fighting the, 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 the pandemic. They introduced social isolation, they introduced the rapid scaling of testing uh, uh, and isolating of, pa of patients and so on. And you can see they managed successfully to, to control the pandemic. They had only about 8,000 8, cases uh, uh, in the country. There's very little mortality com compared to Italy, which is still suffering from what's going on, on, the, on, on, on uh, with the pandemic. Next slide, please. This slide just shows you what, what we did here in, in, in England. Uh, since in the 5th of March, uh, we've been cured with an uh, notifiable disease. Then we introduced measures gradually to close the schools and so on. And on the 20th of March, that's when we first, the, the, uh, England started introducing the lockdown. And at that time, on the, tw on the 5th of March, uh, the 20th of March, sorry, we have about 5,000 uh, cases and only 233 deaths at that time on the, on the 20th of March. Next slide, please. This slide just shows you the case fatality rate and the cases per 100,000 100, uh, in different European countries. As you can see, Spain uh, in, in the lead there with very high numbers per 100,000 and also high mortality rate, uh, and, and Italy, and Belgium, and so on. United Kingdom in red there, uh, we are uh, still have very high mortality compared to, although the numbers are not as excessive as Spain and Italy, but we have a high mortality there compared to them. While you take countries like Germany, I just want you to notice that Germany there is, is very high, uh, uh, although they have more cases than uh, England, but the mortality is very, very low. It's 2.8 uh, per 100,000 cases compared to England, which is about 13 uh, cases per 100,000 cases. Next slide, please. So, why is England still suffering or having big problems? This slide there shows you when uh, uh, the lockdown was introduced in different countries around the world. And, and as you can see, that some of the countries they introduced the lockdown very early on, although they didn't have the same number of cases like the United Kingdom. And the United Kingdom only introduced that, as I said, on the 20th, which is the number four on the, on the, on the table there, uh, only on the 20th of March. So it was, I think, uh, some people say very late, and they delayed it, and maybe that's why uh, they, 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 they have problems, still having problems with, with, with the epidemic. Again, with the lockdown, of course, one of the other issues which you need to introduce to fight them is to have vast amount of testing, large amount of testing, to pick up people uh, and, and, and mm -hmm. isolate them, admit them to the hospital, and so on. But the United Kingdom have problems with this testing. Next slide, please. The problem we had here is that we have a shortage of diagnostic tests because this pandemic uh, hit 
most of the countries of the world and most of the well uh, developed countries of the world. So they were, they were all, uh, they don't have a problem with, with paying for these tests. So the demand was very high and, uh, and, and, and so there was big shortage because all the countries wanted the same uh, material for the testing. The other problem we had in the United Kingdom, of course, here we don't have a diagnostic manufacturing industry in the United Kingdom. So big, all the big companies, diagnostic companies like the Roche, the Abbott, the Takagi, they're all based outside the United Kingdom. And we know that now, for example, the United States have, have, have some sort of an embargo, anything diagnostic to leave out the United States because they want it in themselves. Again, there was a questionable quality of some of the tests which came through. Uh, uh, and they were not very good, so they, we couldn't use them. We didn't have a very good, uh, still, uh, reliable serologic test to look for IgG or IgM. Some tests on the market, but they are not very good. Then we have a problem with logistics of having test facilities, how we store and transport diagnostic material, uh, a reporting of results and so on. So we have a big, big issue because suddenly we are faced with this big, big demand uh, I, I, and, and I think United Kingdom were, were, were not ready. Next slide, please. This is just to show you the projection of the test, the molecular tests that need to be by till the end of April. Uh, the black line is the what what is need to be done daily, about 30,000 tests uh, per day, uh, and we are still very early on. We are doing about 16 or 15,000 tests so far. But this is what the projection, what is supposed to happen by the end of the month. Whether we will be able to do that or not is still questionable. Next slide, please. So, the the, the plan now is 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 to, the plan is to have these five pillars. The first pillar is to increase the number of molecular testing. Uh, as I said, the projection is to get to about thirty thousand, and, and introduce also commercial. Uh, PCRs and so on, so you can increase the amount of testing in the community. And the third pillar is to have a good antibody testing as a diagnostic test. Uh, and then pillar four is to have a very big uh, also serological platforms to do a large zero surveillance studies in the community. And then the, the five, fifth pillar is to actually not to be faced with the same problem again, to have a big diagnostic national uh, industry in in the country, which of course is going to take time. So they are working now within all these uh, uh, pillars, different categories of the of the public health and and, and, and NHS are working uh, on these pillars. But there are still large problems and big problems facing them. Next slide, please. So this is my last slide, and and and. Just to show you that this virus is very, very, is, is, is very transmissible. It affects uh, uh, age, average patient, affects about up to 2.4 people. It mainly, mm -hmm. uh, uh, as Dr. Hamour said, it infects the elderly. Fatality is my main seen about the elderly. Uh, the under 40 seems less than 2.2 uh, percent, and the one the other uh, uh, men are also, as Dr. Hamour mentioned, are highly infected compared to women, and there is a lot of no unknowns. We know that, for example, unsymptomatic uh, people are, are, are a source of, of, of infection, but we don't know how the magnitude of that and what part they play on the, on, on the pandemic. Uh, we don't know, for example, yet, if you recover from the infection, are you going to become immune or not? And we don't know whether this virus is going to be seasonal, for example, just like all other respiratory viruses, which will come only in winter, it's going to be all year around. So these are all unknowns uh, 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 about this uh, about this virus. Um, but the, the immediate thing, of course, is to, 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 to overcome the current problem and then uh, get to the, to the next stage. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Hussam. Uh, for this um, you know, presentation, which ended exactly that we are uncertain about the virus. It's hitting the health service significantly, globally, and I think it highlights that um, the issue with health is not uh, just a national, it's something that has to be looked at um, um, between all different countries uh, uh, away from politics.
So thank you very much. I think we may come back with some questions later. Um, I would like to introduce um, the last uh, presentation, which is going to be delivered by um, two colleagues. Uh, Dr. Uh, Ibrahim Fauzi, the ex-chair of critical care, ECMO, lead and consultant intensivist in Hamad General Hospital in Qatar, and my colleague, Suhail Jamal, who is a consultant, anesthetist, and intensivist in Hamad Hospital in Qatar. Uh, Okay, uh, thank you, Sarah, and thanks for, for the introduction. Uh, first of all, I would like uh, to say Kulam uh, Shab Sudani Wasur Sudani Bi Al Fakhir. At these uh, difficult times, where we were hoping that everybody is going to be breathing uh, the breeze of freedom, uh, unfortunately, it coincides with this pandemic, which uh, humanity hasn't seen for a while, and made us all breathe heavily. But hopefully, many many returns and uh, in which the country and the people of Sudan are breathing the breath of freedom and liberty once more. So uh, my, my, my part of the talk is, quite, is going to be quite brief. So uh, I'll be mainly setting the stage for my colleague, uh, Dr. Ibrahim, uh, about when it comes to about our critical care preparedness for COVID-19 pandemic. And hopefully he will get the tough questions uh, from you guys. So, uh, first slide, please. Okay, so we all know the numbers, yeah? So every day you turn on your TV, you see these numbers popping up uh, on your screen. The cases confirmed are going up. The cases uh, recovering are also going up, not at the rate uh, that we would like to see, uh, but at least it is going up. And the number of deaths, unfortunately, uh, is going up as well. These numbers, I think, were from this morning. Uh, John Hopkins seems to be the center now, which everyone is referring to, to get uh, the numbers. I'm sure these numbers are up a couple of thousands uh, since, since the last time I, I checked. And as you can see in the map above, it's, the disease is not really uniformly spread. You can see that there's hot spots there now shifting from mainland China to Europe and the uh, UK, uh, Spain and Italy being quite hot at the moment and also moving across the Atlantic where New York seems to be picking up. Uh, but we can see a relative uh, spareness or scarcity uh, in Africa, especially Sub-Saharan Africa, which is uh, making people postulate different theories and uh, what's the cause behind it and which probably uh, we're going to deal with in our discussion. Next uh, slide, please. So uh, I tried to look for numbers of ICU admission, and there is nothing really uh, established there. We, we know it goes up as the death uh, mortality are going up as well. These were the numbers I could get uh, from Dave Manka in Italy. And uh, he was looking at uh, the ICU uh, patients, so the number growing in his ICU in Lombardy. And you can see it's almost a linear and an exponential uh, growth, as you can see in the case on the right in, on Italy. And the, sc the scary bit is that the, what we call the lower inflection point, and that's the point where the graph really takes off, okay, can happen at quite a low uh, number. So if you, if you see there, you can see that after 10 days, uh, probably uh, the number was around 200, but in five days after that, it doubled to 500, and then it goes up. And it goes up quite exponentially, which is, which is quite uh, scary. Now, this, of course, depends, and the limiting factor for it is how many ICU beds you have in that region because a lot of patients in, in countries where there's no abundance of ICU beds uh, are not included in, uh, will not be included in graphs like these and unfortunately will, might pass away uh, unrecognized by our figures. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, as the two previous uh, speakers have pointed out, you can see that the majority of patients who will have COVID-19 will have mild uh, to moderate uh, symptoms. And actually, the best way to, to combat that is, is, the, is isolation and social distancing. However, a portion of them will have some kind of severe, high, moderately to severe uh, symptoms and would, would necessitate them to go to the hospital and get a bit of oxygen therapy. The minority, uh, which is usually quoted around 5%, 
of patients will uh, develop critical symptoms and might need uh, critical care. Now, the problem is when you look at the resources required to deal with this, it's the opposite way. So those who are critically ill and will go to require mechanical ventilation and ICU therapy would need a hell of resources, uh, whether it being manpower, being it equipment, being it medications, uh, and uh, etc. So, uh, and, and that's, that's one of the big problems when it comes to dealing with uh, COVID-19 and uh, going, uh, again, not being able really to flatten the curve that you will need a lot of resources and it's for a uh, small population. Uh, next, please. So, uh, another problem which shows itself is how we manage the uh, this uh, pandemic uh, and uh, medical management, I mean. And there is a lot of societies out there who published a lot of consistent statements, like, you know, the Surviving Sepsis Campaign, for example, or the Australians, New Zealand, the Anzix in New Zealand, New Zealand and Australia, or the European Society, a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, societies which uh, publish different uh, recommendations. Uh, but probably the one most of the world would go with is the World Health Organization. And I would like to point out to the pretty much the first two lines you read when you read this document, and which says that this is, publication is adopted from the clinical management of severe acute respiratory infection in MERS. Okay? So uh, we don't, and the reason for that, I mean, we don't know a lot about the COVID. We don't have a lot of randomized controlled trials, as you would imagine, in this short uh, time. And there are some of the research that's coming with very, very small numbers. Uh, so you have, you know, studies which have 80 patients and stuff like that, which usually would never have seen its way through a, uh, a peer journal, but now it's making all its way to JAMA and all, all top-ranked uh, journals. So that's, that's a problem. Uh, we're extrapolating what we know from the SARS and from, from MERS to COVID, which is not necessarily true. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah, so uh, when it comes to how can we be prepared in ICU, I mean, uh, this, this is a list which was prepared by the Society, uh, the Society of Critical Medicine in the U.S., which mainly covers seven areas, preparedness, logistics, communication, triaging, protection of staff, and uh, essential equipment. Now, each, each one of those, I would imagine, is a talk uh, on, its, on itself, and uh, how much and how far can you go with each one and what are the limitations. It's, it's quite a big talk, and I love and uh, I'll leave it here. Actually, this is my last slide because I'm gonna pass the heat on to my colleague and friend uh, Ibrahim. Hopefully, he will he'll have some answers in his presentation. Ibrahim. Ibrahim. Can you hear me now? Sorry, sorry for that. Can you hear yeah. me? Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Uh, it's uh, a pleasure to be part of uh, this fantastic group. Um, as you know, my name is Ibrahim Fauzi. I'm uh, Director of Critical Care at Hamad and ECMO Program Director. Um, and uh, I have the luxury to be trained partly between the U.S., most of my training at Cornell and at, and at London, and guys and Thomas. So um, I will follow on uh, of what Dr. Suhail actually uh, talked, and I will try to really uh, cover uh, basic aspects and uh, general aspects as well. And I start with the next slide, please. Uh, <clears throat> uh, can I have next slide, please? This is uh, the way to do quarantine. Uh, no, you go back, please, to uh, uh, the Arabic uh, version. You can go back. So, إذا سمعت به بأرض فلا تدخل عليه وإذا وقع بأرض وانتم بها فلا تخرج منها فرارا من والمقيم بها كالشهيد صدق رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. So this is the start, and I think this is the basics of how to do quarantine. We have to really follow the instruction. Uh, if we go to the objective of my talk, which is next slide, please. 
uh, what I will be covering is uh, some general principles so to give you uh, a bit of facts about COVID. Um, and then I will uh, focus uh, in critical care aspect uh, and we'll touch uh, about equipment, main power utilization, and how should we plan uh, for Sudan, for instance. Uh, next slide, please. So, <clears throat> in general principle, um, we need to know uh, certain rules. Uh, number one, it's actually a new virus. Uh, it's not the regular coronavirus that we uh, used to deal with, whether it's MERS or SARS, it's a bit different. It's actually a mix of both. Um, <clears throat> it's evolving science. Every day we are learning something new about this virus and uh, how it affects uh, the human and how is the body respond to it. So every day we will have new data. And I see a lot of questions on coagulation, uh, chloroquine and other drugs. We will try to cover uh, part of that, but every day we learn something new. Um, it's very contagious um, and our colleagues already spoke about that. Uh, one to two point six, three point two ratio uh, of people that get infected. Um, and it's also very complex pathophysiological effect, which I'm going to talk about it. Um, and people uh, hear about the fatality rate. His fatality rate is very undermining of this virus because this virus is so contagious and 80% of the patients who receive it um, are usually asymptomatic or mild symptoms. But the ICU mortality of this COVID virus is actually as high as the MERS coronavirus, 50% mortality. It can range from 20 to 50% mortality, which is very, very high. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? <clears throat> so, as I said, um, every day new publication uh, regarding pathology and treatment aspect. Uh, next slide, please, which I'm going to go quickly. I already explained about the next one, um, which is it's overwhelmed. It overwhelmed top healthcare system in the world. We have example of the United States, Italy, and other. And it's very important to spend uh, your resources to contain this virus rather than face um, the nerve Im immunity and to face the massive casualty because this is a, it's a suicide um, <clears throat> uh, for, 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 for the country. Okay. Uh, going to the next slide, which is a very high IC mortality. Um, if you go to the next slide. So in this slide, uh, there's two data, one from the UK and one from China. And I put the UK because uh, uh, you can see 50% ICU mortality. This is mean if two patients come, one of them die in the intensive care. And UK is very selective, so they don't admit everybody to their ICU. This number is exactly the same in Italy. It's exactly the same in China. Uh, it's very high. This is very scary. That's what the problem with this COVID virus is not just um, um, it's because of uh, fatality rate is low, but if you end up in the intensive care, you have a 50% mortality risk. This is very scary. Uh, if you go to the next slide, you will see the age group. Uh, and this is also published by the ECNAR. Can you go to the next slide, please? Next slide, please. Okay, so here you can see uh, age 16 to 49. These are young people, 23% mortality. Four admitted, one died. This is very, very high. This is comparing to 10% for different virus pneumonias. So it's not only the rumor that uh, this is only for elderly. It actually kills young people who are healthy as well. So we have to be careful with this disease because it's, uh, it's, uh, if you end up in the intensive care, uh, the likelihood of death is anything between 23 and 50%. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, Staff Safety is one of the big founders for this uh, COVID virus. Uh, hundreds of Italian doctors and other nurses, uh, healthcare providers uh, got infected and a lot of the, them died actually, uh, which also add another burden. So when we prepare anything uh, to face this pandemic and epidemic in a country, you have to really take care of your soldiers. Uh, these are frontliners. So when you plan, you need to plan it as such that you can protect your, 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 your fighters. Otherwise, you'll end up with equipment on ICU and no one to operate them. So this is an important fact. So let's move to the next slide, uh, two slides quickly, uh, which I'm going to talk about critical care aspect. If you can move to the next one as well, uh, a bit of pathophysiology. So this virus, uh, when it comes in, uh, it binds to a receptor core ACE2, angiotensin converting enzyme uh, 2. Uh, receptor and with that it enters the cell, it replicates 
um, and it uh, form uh, another virus. So we use the respiratory cell, the lung cell, to be their factories. And the concept of ACE is important because everybody asks about angiotensin converting enzyme. Um, most of the data actually doesn't uh, support that using these drugs uh, can affect the virus uh, in, a, in a bad way. It's actually it's a protective. Uh, but this is the way uh, the virus uses the cells and replicate um, and then cause the disease. So if you move to the next slide, please. Most of the treatment is working toward uh, inhibition of this replication, whether it's uh, anti-malaria with uh, HIV and other protease inhibitors. It works to inhibit this. So if you go to the next slide, it will give you, for instance, uh, the effect of hydroxychloroquine, which is inhibit the pH in the lysosome, so it inhibit the virus replication and release inside the cell. Uh, there is another drug, Evramectin, that's coming up. It also inhibits the par uh, passage of part of the virus to the nucleus. Uh, and most of, the, uh, most of the drugs work on this phase, is to inhibit the virus replication. Uh, when you go to the next slide, please. Um, next slide. So the next slide show you effect on the lung because um, most of the uh, tropic of this virus to the to the respiratory system, although it can go to the GI, and that's why some some of the patients will present with diarrhea because they also carry the ACE2 receptor. Um, as I said, my, most patients go to the right side, which is the mild infection uh, majority, but some patients will progress to acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is a severe inflammation in the lung. Uh, but not only that, it's not just uh, inflammation in the lung. It has a different mechanism than uh, most of the other viruses because it affects the vascular permeability. It affects uh, uh, producing pulmonary capillary microthrombi, um, the VQM mismatch. So it's not uh, just one mechanism of hypoxemia, which will, uh, I'll explain in the next uh, uh, few slides <clears throat> as well. So if you go to the next slide, uh, it will show you a different also mechanism. Um, if you go to the next slide, it uh, also affects the hemoglobin uh, uh, beta chain um, and um, the affinity to the hemoglobin. And this is, uh, in its own, can carry uh, a lot of problem. It also increases the risk of hypercoagulable state um, and can produce patient to microthrombi, but also pulmonary embolism uh, as well. So there's so many uh, mechanisms. This is completely different than MERS corona. We, we treated MERS corona. Um, some of them very, have high mortality, but this is a bit a different uh, uh, disease. It's not just a respiratory, it uh, gives you uh, more than just respiratory. If you go to the next uh, slide, it will show you the different subtypes um, uh, in the lung. So uh, the type in the, in the right, which is the phenotype H, you can see the CT scan. This is two different patients with COVID. One, uh, both of them have a low PF ratio, PO2 to FI2 ratio. One with a consolidated lung, the one on the right, phenotype H. This is what we usually see. We see this in MERS, we see this in H1 and uh, N1, we see this in bacteria and pneumonia, and we know how to treat this very well, actually. Um, low type uh, protective lung ventilation and so on. The algorithm is pretty clear. But the phenotype L, that is a different emerging thing that doesn't have a lot of lung uh, findings but it affects mostly the microthrombi, the hemoglobin, affect the DQ mismatch, and so on. And these type of patients, if you give them high pressure, uh, you can actually cause a lot of death among these patients. So they have to be treated carefully, and you have to identify these patients. So if you go to the next slide, which was adapted from my friend Luigi, um, and uh, obviously Professor Gattinoni, uh, looking at the management of these patients when they get intubated, you have to assist the lung compliance and differentiate these two types, uh, whether it's a L type or F or H type, uh, and you put your strategy. But if you look to both, something called prone responsiveness, prone position ventilation, is a, something that is, um, it doesn't require any uh, budget. You just train your people to do prone position, which means uh, the person sleeps in his abdomen or freeing the abdomen, and that improves the lung mechanics uh, significantly. Uh, and I think this is, uh, if you have a resource limited, that's where you need to really uh, train your team to do prone position ventilation. You can do it even before intubation. Um, next slide is important uh, because it's, uh, if you go to the next slide. Can we go to the next slide, please? So this, this slide shows you stages because it's not only lung that get affected. Uh, stage one is early infection. Stage two is a pulmonary phase where you get all the findings that I said, that I described earlier. But stage three, some of the patient will progress to host inflammatory response phase. 
uh, which we call cytokine storm syndrome. Um, and these patients, actually, majority of them end up with a vascular collapse, with myocardial depression, um, cardiogenic shock, um, and a lot of them die uh, from stage 3. Even if you fix everything in the lung, uh, some of the patients will progress to this disease. So you really need to know where are you in the phase of management of this patient to tailor your therapy according to the phase. Uh, so if you go to the next phase, the next slide, uh, the next slide will tell you uh, therapeutic options. Uh, therapeutic options are really uh, targeting uh, uh, three areas, uh, viral replication inhibitors, which is uh, chloroquine, hydrochloroquine, and all these drugs. Remember that all these drugs, is uh, it's a it's a disparate measure really because we don't have a randomized clinical trial but now we don't have time for that so you know we we, we there is no time to prove it um, so there is all depend on a very small study um, but you know what that's that's what we have so we cannot uh, we have to balance the risk of this drug versus the benefit uh, the second group is a pulmonary support is a patient who is especially in a phenotype L that require uh, some VQ matching, which is nitric oxide, prostacyclin, some anticoagulation, and corticosteroid uh, can help in certain group of patients. Group three, it uh, work mostly in the in the in the cytokine storm syndrome, which is uh, tocilizumab, interleukin six inhibitors, uh, derivative IL IL one inhibitors, uh, and corticosteroid. So those are sort of the option, and uh, I think um, the science is still evolving, and we're learning every day something, and you the list will increase. So moving to the next uh, next slide, please, it's uh, tell you, okay, so now you have all this uh, disease with a different toxicology. Everybody talk about ventilation, uh, ventilator, ventilator. Ventilator is essential, obviously, but I think uh, there is a lot of other things that you need to think of, uh, especially in a country response. Yeah, country response, yes, you have to have ventilators. Uh, you have to have an oxygen source and reservoir. You have to set up intensive care, uh, whether it's a hospital or field hospital. You have to think of other equipment that it work together, which is infusion pump, cardiac monitors, medication. Uh, and very, very important is the PPE for staff protection, because if you lose your staff, uh, you have no soldier to fight. So, uh, um, you know, weapon alone is not going to be enough. Uh, if you go to the next slide, which uh, talk about the manpower. Uh, so the manpower is uh, essential, right? So we know we have shortage worldwide in critical care staffing whether it's in the UK, in the US, in Sudan, and cover everywhere, there is a shortage of the staff, uh, whether they are doctor, nurses, or team. So with a pandemic and epidemic like this, this should be a mechanism to utilize non-critical non clinicians to join the pool and to really have a quick training uh, uh, and induction to let them join the workforce. Uh, same as you do when you have a war, you call for a volunteers and you train them how to uh, you know do the basic stuff and then you deploy them more than assistance so that would have to be thought in a countrywide um, and it's very important for this ICU staffing and non-critical care and critical care to be proximal to each other so you expand proximally uh, to improve the utilization of your staff don't dispatch them in a different side because that will just uh, make them uh, ineffective um, moving to the next slide which we're, I'm gonna skip uh, quickly uh, so if you go to the next slide, please, um, when you do staffing model, you have to think about patient safety, staff safety, uh, that is a sustainable plan, is a dynamic, and, and, uh, and can be um, uh, deployed in different sites. Moving to the next slide. So in, in, in Qatar, we thought about uh, uh, t training uh, various doctors uh, from different specialty, and term medicine, surgery. Obviously, anesthesia already have a, a very good understanding of critical care anyway. They are intensive at most of them. But the non-intensivists, uh, they get induction uh, course and training. We develop a curriculum, and I think this is what we need to focus to enhance the skills of non-critical care providers uh, to be to let them be able to uh, treat, treat these patients. With the, if the number comes high, we have to be prepared. Um, some of them will do hands-on training before they join uh, the battlefield. And I put some example of the model in the next slide. Um, uh, can you go to the next slide, please? So that's, uh, that's just uh, an example uh, of, uh, of a model how you have one, one doctor uh, overseeing. So this doctor can be different specialists. You can have one IC doctor covering like uh, 90 patients, uh, for instance. Uh, but he has to have the support structure, uh, the intermediate uh, clinician who will support and uh, really zone the patient in different areas. So, and I will talk about this in the next uh, two slides. Can we move to the next uh, two slides quickly because of the time? Uh, next one, please. Yes, this one. Okay, this is good. 
So here it, um, um, okay, fine. So yeah, that's fine. So nurses is uh, pretty much the same. Uh, target uh, nurses that uh, we uh, targeted was the PACU or nurses, uh, internal medicine floor uh, nurses. Um, it's very important also to have nurse educator to help uh, in uh, training them. Uh, it's very important to learn donning and doffing uh, to make sure they are safe uh, to practice uh, in this environment. And prone position ventilation save lives. This is essential. Uh, very simple, does not need resources uh, that people need to really uh, train to do it. Uh, you can do it even before intubation. Uh, it improves VQ match, um, it improves um, uh, lung recruitment, uh, then they have hands-on training and uh, joining uh, the battlefield. Uh, next slide is another model uh, where people uh, utilize, uh, which is say, okay, let's have a different uh, group, uh, intubation team, prone position team, regular management team, and then a team really focused in multi-organ support. So this is all our different models. Uh, none of them is uh, superior to, uh, to another, but it's, uh, it's, it's there, and that's need to be discussed when, uh, you, when the team in Sudan planning to, to deploy that for, for their ICU. Next slide. Next, uh, next slide just summarizes the response. Yeah? Now we have a few cases. So it's very important to early on identify the zone where the infection contain uh, the zone as quickly as possible, and then uh, thinking of a mobile IT deployment. Um, and this is important to start to train and prepare your uh, workforce uh, who can join the battlefield, yeah? Um, from a different IC provider or non-IC provider, mix them up, mix the skill, uh, and they can go and, uh, and fight uh, if you put them in a safe place so they can uh, really give you be uh, best resources. It's important to include intensive care team in the planning uh, because they are the people who's gonna lead the battle. You cannot just, just push them uh, off guard to fight. They need to be prepared to do their best. Um, so I go to the next slide uh, and just uh, summarize up. This is a really a national threat, yeah? It's not just a job of Ministry of Health, it's the Ministry of Defense, Interior, um, Civil Defense, uh, Trading, and so many. Uh, and most important is the people, education of the public, and, uh, you know, hand hygiene and uh, social distances is important to prevent the, the spread. It's very important to prevent it uh, from spreading rather than just treat the massive casualty. So going forward to the next slide, um, which is uh, it's a number one step uh, we would recommend actually to do a national wide critical care network um, uh, over all the country to assist the resources and to really uh, work together because um, you cannot you cannot treat this uh, in isolation. You know this is, has to be a national response for all critical care providers in the country come together, assess equipment, manpower capability, potential recruit workers, a group and deploy your team in the area that it needed the most, yeah? You have to align your manpower uh, by the training uh, of non-IC clinician as well and put the model that work for, for Sudan based on the resources that's available. Uh, ventilation management, pro ventilation PPE is the three thing that people need to learn really. Um, hemodynamic optimization, when you, they go to multi-organ support, this is need to be treated in a special area, but if they have single organ failure, they need to be, uh, you know, the team should be able to, to, to treat these patients. Protocol care based uh, on available country resources. Uh, I cannot put ECMO as a, as, a, as, a, as a tool here because, you know, it's not available. So you have to think what's available in the country and how can you utilize your resources to the maximum best to uh, save uh, people, uh, uh, save lives. It's, uh, you should have an escalation plan uh, based on the phases of the epidemic and ethical principles uh, have to be discussed uh, uh, in each country. So take home message uh, in the next slide, uh, pretty summarizing what I just said um, and all my colleagues before me uh, uh, described. Can you go to the next slide? It's COVID is a new virus. It's a very contagious with evolving fact. 50% ICU mortality at the top ICUs. Talking about UK, Italy, um, uh, US, China, 50% mortality. That's pretty high. Um, PPE ventilation management and prone position ventilation training is required to face the respiratory complication of the COVID-19. Uh, this is not going to help with the cytokine storm. You need to be prepared and to multi-organ support need to be thought of. There is a need to establish national critical care network KSCP to cope with this pandemic. This should be done in every single country. UK have a very good uh, network, but other countries don't. Uh, Italy finally they mobilized their network, but initially they did not mobilize it early. Um, and, and so on. So this, this network is, is the key for the fight. Um, COVID-19 is a national threat, requires countrywide resources mobilization. Prevention uh, is essential. Uh, and I end uh, my presentation with the last slide. 
if you go to the next slide, which is that we have to pray. Allahumma inna na'udhu bika min juhd al-bala' wa barki al-shaqa' wa suwa al-qaba' wa shamat al-a'da' Allahumma inna na'udhu bika min zawal al-i'matik wa tahawwal al-a'afitik wa fajat al-naqmatik wa jami'a sahtik Ghazakum Allah khair Shukran jazeelan Suhail Dr. Ibrahim wa kullu aaman fin bakhair di fikr abdil Shukran Suhail li yani al-tambih bizalik wa Dr. Ibrahim um, very important point, the soldiers and the protections of the soldiers. Uh, this is um, an important issue that we may need to come back to. Shukran Jazeelan, and thank you for all the speakers um, uh, coming today, despite all of the, uh, what's going back home and what you are being doing and working on. We hope for the next, um, uh, I would say, 30 minutes or more that um, Shiza and Muhammad Jamal will take us through the questions and answers. We hope our colleague back home can ask um, all questions um, they uh, would like for the panel. Uh, this um, series of webinars is mainly for uh, bringing us together, supporting each other, and learning uh, from each other. So, Shazo Muhammad, uh, hand over to you. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I'm uh, Shada Taha. Um, I would like to direct the first question to Dr. Abu Abeida. Hello, can you hear me, Dr. Abu Abeida? Okay, so it doesn't seem that Dr. Abu Abeida is with us um, on the panel. So I would like to direct the first question to Dr. Suhail Ahmed, please. Hi, hi Rashida. Um, so the first question is from Dr. Mawahib. How can Sudan handle the situation with very limited resources for ICU? Well, I think uh, we have to get our priorities right. So uh, when we are under-resourced, you try to use the resources to prevent the masses from needing advanced uh, support. So uh, the way we're playing it now in, in terms of uh, education, 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 social distancing, hand hygiene, you know, sneezing your uh, at your elbow. I think this is the right this is the right path, you know. Uh, then the second step, which will come if this does not contain the virus, is of course having uh, dedicated, well-equipped, centered, and trained personnel, as Dr. Ibrahim was uh, alluding to, which can deal with these advanced uh, cases. And stressing on what we have got and simple maneuvers that make a big difference, such as teaching the staff how to prone the patient and how to look after the prone patient, instead of going after getting expensive, uh, expensive equipment, which no one will know how to deal with such as equipment and stuff like that. Thank you. The next question is from Dr. Lamia Al Hassan. Um, she's mentioned that this curve is seen almost identically in all question in all countries with the confirmed COVID cases. Is this something that you've also observed or witnessed? Uh, sorry, Shazai, is this uh, directed to me or to Ibrahim? Or? Um, she did direct it to you, but maybe we can later on ask Dr. Hussam to comment on this. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Suhail, for answering the questions. I will now move on to Dr. Abu Abayd Hamur, please. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. So, um, so the first question was, doctor, was from Dr. Ahmed Saad al -Din. He had a few questions. Um, he's, his first question was, so you started anti-COVID um, in your patient, although his test was still pending. Uh, yes, the, uh, the internist who saw the patient uh, in ER uh, 
uh, made a clinical diagnosis of COVID based on the clinical uh, presentation and the uh, lymphopenia um, and the uh, minor changes on the X-ray, and he decided to start the patient on on that uh, combination. And um, and the uh, uh, next question also uh, is about uh, uh, sending the patient home with an abnormal X-ray. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the patient was clinically stable, and the physician who saw this patient uh, um, made the uh, judgment that, that the patient was, uh, uh, could be managed at home, and uh, he gave the patient clear uh, you know, guidance uh, to return to ER uh, if he developed uh, breathlessness, uh, and that is uh, uh, exactly what happened. Two days later, the patient came back uh, uh, because the uh, of worsening uh, breathlessness, uh, but he made the judgment that he was stable enough uh, to be managed at home, uh, at least initially, uh, because the course could not be predicted. He could have uh, equally improved and not come back. Uh, so uh, that is a reasonable strategy in a patient who is uh, stable and not hypoxemic, doesn't have any signs of severe pneumonia, uh, is not requiring uh, oxygen supplementation. Um, uh, so that was a judgment call. He also uh, went on to ask about lymphopenia. Yes, uh, the lymphopenia, um, as I mentioned, as I mentioned in my presentation, is a cardinal feature of uh, uh, COVID-19 disease. Uh, over 80% of patients uh, are likely to have uh, lymphopenia, um, uh, and, and and that is that is almost a uh, a, um, an invariable uh, feature. Um, I think the questioner asked whether the lymphopenia could also be caused by some of the uh, treatments. Um, the, um, uh, I mean, in, our, in the patient, if the question was related to the case I presented, uh, the patient did have lymphopenia even before he was started on any medication. So it was, in this case, was not related to uh, to, to, to treatment. Um, of course, there are some medications that may cause lymphopenia, such as uh, uh, immunosuppressive therapies and so on, uh, but this patient was not on any immunosuppressive therapies at the time of, uh, of presentation. Uh, so uh, this was part of the COVID-19 disease, um, uh, and it is, it is a very important clinical clue to the diagnosis of this condition. Uh, the uh, the uh, next question from the uh, I have here on my list is the uh, uh, use of plasma for uh, of the recovered patient. Uh, the use of convalescent convalescent plasma. Um, they are anecdotal reports in the literature um, showing that this may be beneficial. But uh, uh, to date, there are no uh, controlled studies. Uh, here in Canada, could somebody mute their phone, please? There is a lot of noise in the background. I can't even hear myself. Um, in Canada, there is a large multicenter study looking at the uh, utility of convalescent plasma, and I'm sure there are similar studies elsewhere that are looking at precisely at this question to see whether convalescent plasma can be uh, used uh, in, in, in this setting. To obviously, it's not a new treatment, and this is a time-honored, uh, old-fashioned therapy in infectious disease uh, management to use convalescent plasma, uh, and that is the basis of this uh, of these of these studies. But as yet, there are no uh, there is no data from uh, multicenter or randomized studies to recommend it on a wide scale. So for now, we have to use it only as part of studies. And this applies to all the other medication, whether it's chloroquine or whether it is uh, uh, anti-IL-6, uh, anti like uh, trucilizumab or, uh, or other agents. Uh, there, there are really no controlled data to, to support the use of any of these experimental agents. And here in Canada, our position is that these experimental drugs should only be used in the setting of clinical trials. That is the, the standard of care that we have uh, in all Canadian provinces right now. 
let me see if I've got uh, um, uh, there's a question about heparin uh, uh, and, and uh, this is uh, this is gaining momentum um, the pathogenesis of this disease as uh, explained by my colleagues uh, involves micro, uh, thrombo, uh, micro emboli or uh, uh, micro thrombosis in uh, in the lungs uh, and there is uh, mounting evidence to support uh, the, the uh, recommendation of anticoagulation. I know there is a document that has come out in the NHS supporting the use of anticoagulants um, uh, and, and similar documents uh, uh, have come out from Mount Sinai hospitals and other, other uh, jurisdictions supporting the use of therapeutic doses of heparin, uh, either uh, into, uh, infusion or uh, enoxaparin or low molecular weight heparin um, in, in, in this uh, uh, setting. And there are some, some, uh, some studies that show benefit. Thank you. Uh, so that answers the questions for Dr. Iman Zubair as well as Dr. Ala Al Malik. Um, we'll move on to Dr. Ishraqa's question. Um, um, about be, is being from a black or minority ethnic background not a feature as is pro widely propagated in the media? Um, this question has also been asked by Dr. Ahmed. Um, I am not sure if I, if I know the answer to that question, whether this is uh, uh, just they happen, it happen, it's a chance or whether uh, there is some other uh, uh, reason for that. Uh, I know that there's been a call for an inquiry and an investigation uh, in the UK to look at uh, why uh, all the uh, 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 casualties on the front line have been uh, uh, international or, uh, or uh, uh, immigrant positions. Um, uh, but uh, we would all uh, await with interest uh, the uh, if there is any uh, uh, scientific reason for that, or if there is any, or this is just a mere chance, uh, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I'd be speculating if I tried to answer that question. May I, may I just ask you uh, if, if Hassan would like to make any comments on this area, Shaza, please? Sorry, in which area? Um, the question that uh, Shaza have just asked about the risk factors from what you have seen, um, the uh, sort of black, Asian, and my, uh, minor ethnicity? Yes, I mean, there is, uh, this, this, this is a hot, hot, hot issue here in the United Kingdom. Um, people are looking at the data now to see if that's really uh, a significant factor of, of, or, of or the, the other issues or the other factors in addition to the, to the BAM uh, question. So we don't have the answer yet, uh, but everybody now is looking into that. I, I know that, for example, in my process, they are, they are investigating that and they're looking at all the cases uh, and looking at all, uh, to see if there are any confounding factors or this is a, a true risk factor. So we don't know the answer to that yet. Thank you. Um, so this question is directed back to Dr. Abu Abeida. Um, Dr. Ishraqa, um, Dr. Hiba has asked why is hypertension considered a serious risk for developing severe disease? Um, uh, thank you. Um, the, this has been obviously observed in the Chinese uh, data that uh, patients with uh, uh, comorbidities, including hypertension, um, uh, have a, a poor uh, outcome. Um, it's not entirely clear at this uh, stage whether it's hypertension uh, uh, per se or uncontrolled hypertension. Uh, it may be uh, lack of control hypertension. Uh, but also there is additional question of whether uh, I think we need more data or some analysis of these studies to see um, was it hypertension or was it its treatment? Um, uh, and I tried to find an answer to that question before one of my previous uh, talks, and I couldn't uh, from the literature, uh, because there is this uh, 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 connection with the AC2 um, receptor in the alveoli, and it's postulated that patients who are on ACE inhibitors may upregulate their receptors 
and hence become more prone to severe disease. This is not proven uh, on a clinical, at a clinical level. It's only a hypothesis uh, that, uh, you know, being on an ACE inhibitor may upregulate uh, the receptors and hence uh, make the person more susceptible to uh, a higher viral uh, load or higher viremia uh, or, or viral infection in the lung. Um, so it, it's not entirely, this area uh, is not entirely clear and requires further, further uh, uh, analysis as to see whether it's actually hypertension itself or its treatment uh, or lack of control are the culprits or are, are, make, are, are what is make, making people uh, uh, susceptible to poorer outcome or to fatalities. Thank you. Um, Dr. Iman has asked, how is Canada monitoring the side effects of chloroquine? Are there any cases of significance that you may note and share with us, please? Uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, in Canada, chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine are not recommended as standard therapy for COVID disease. They're only uh, used as part of clinical trials. Uh, that is not to say that there are some people who are prescribing them, uh, you know, off their own bat, so to speak. Um, uh, and one of the reasons that, the, in fact, the Royal College issued a very, all the Royal Colleges, the Royal College of Physicians, Nursing, Pharmacists, issued a very stern uh, warning about the use of uh, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine in COVID because there's just simply no data. Uh, in fact, today I saw a, a study pre-publication in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, that is going to be published uh, showing that chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine actually resulted in more people ending up on a ventilator. And this study is from China. Uh, so uh, it's, it's not a panacea, as Mr. Trump would like the world to believe. The, the data for chloroquine is very, very controversial, and more and more we are seeing more data uh, showing a negative effect of chloroquine. Furthermore, chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine are not without their side effects. They um, may result in uh, uh, QT prolongation, especially in combination with azithromycin. They may result in arrhythmias and uh, cause uh, significant uh, morbidity. So they are not, uh, you know, the safest drugs in the world. Um, the you, their use should be restricted to these uh, clinical trials. Uh, whether we are monitoring this uh, in Canada, uh, of course, this is monitored as part of the clinical trial data. Uh, this, is, uh, this is one of the reasons to restrict the use of these drugs within clinical trials so that side effects can be closely monitored and in a clinical trial setting where there is a rigorous scientific uh, uh, scrutiny uh, of all side effects and so on, and that's why they, they, they they're, they're restricted to to uh, uh, to clinical trials. I hope that answers the question. Thank you very much for answering all the questions, Dr. Abu Abeda. We'll now be moving to Dr. Hussam Osman. Okay. Um, Dr. Hussam Osman, just the question earlier. Um, about the COVID graph that we mentioned to Dr. Sohel. Have you noticed the same pattern um, with your experience in other countries as well? Um, sorry, I can't remember the graph. Which graph is that? Sorry. Um, there was a question from Dr. Iman about the COVID graph pattern, so the prevalence of cases. Is it similar to all countries, or is it specific to basically your local country? No, it is. It is the pattern of the epidemic is, 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 is the same in each country. When once it gets hold of the country, and you have local spread, then it will take the same uh, the same pattern, which will go an upward curve, and then it depends upon the response of the country where how quickly they can flatten the curve. But the, the pattern is the same. Yeah. 
Thank you. Um, Dr. Ahmed Saadeddin has asked a few questions. He would asked, um, can the COVID e coexist with H1N1 or MERS MERS COV? Um, as I said in my in the last in my last slide, we don't know whether this virus is going to be it's going to be a seasonal virus. It's going to take uh, be all year around, or so we don't know because it's a new virus. Um, if it becomes like a, like like a, uh, other respiratory virus, they do coexist during the winter. Of course, we get lots of uh, influenza and, and, and RSV, for example, and, and and so on, circulating in the community at the same time. Um, we don't know what virus. This is a new virus. Uh, most of the cases now we are seeing, they don't. Have, they are not infected by other viruses. Uh, and, and but there is a, there is a lack of data because not everybody is, is tested for every other uh, respiratory viruses. But uh, 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 we don't know actually the answer to that because, as I said, it's only three months in, 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 in the age of this virus. So. It's difficult to answer that question right now. Dr. Fadil has also asked a related question about the yellow fever vaccine. Against um, can it also be useful against SARS-CoV-2? Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't know why it should be because that these are completely different viruses. They don't bring to the same family there. Uh, so I don't know why uh, he's mentioned that. Um, and then the yellow fever vaccine is called, so you can't use it for mass vaccination because it's got its own problems anyhow. So now the yellow fever vaccine is, is restricted to people who are traveling to endemic areas. It's, you can't, it's very difficult, I think it's going to be very difficult to use it for mass uh, vaccination. But I don't think it will work because they're completely different viruses, so uh, I don't think it, it, it will work. Thank you. He has also asked, um, how can we explain the low confirmed cases in the meningitis belt in Africa, including Sudan? Um, and what most valuable advice would you give to Sudan? Um, the question about the, 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 that belt uh, 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 is, is it's, I don't think we know the answer to that. But my, my feeling is the, uh, the virus will get to this area. Uh, is just having uh, uh, widely yet, and I'm not sure the testing is being done uh, on those areas to to find out the true uh, magnitude of the of the of the of the, uh, of the of the of this pandemic on that region. Um, so we we'll just have to wait and see whether it's just a true uh, uh, phenomenon or not. The advice is is definitely, definitely the public health advice should be followed. All the measures that the government is, 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 is uh, asking for should be implemented. Uh, isolation, social distancing, uh, embargoes, uh, washing of hands, all those things have to be followed because as you can see from all the presentations today, this is not a joke, this is a very serious illness and people should really follow the public health advice uh, because if, if it gets foothold in Sudan, it's going to be very difficult to control with the resources we have. Thank you. Dr. Catherine Thomas has asked something related as well. Her question was, what will happen in large cities in poor countries if physical distancing and lockdowns cannot be maintained? Um, because there is no, I mean, there is no vaccine yet. Drugs, as everybody mentioned, there is no good drugs. So the only way we can fight this is, is, as I said, follow the public health advice. Try to isolate people, isolate patients, uh, 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 isolate people, uh, washing hand, cleanliness, and so on. That's the only way we can. We, we, uh, this is the only tools we have at our hand currently. Uh, if the drugs uh, prove useful, and, and I, I, I doubt that, anyhow, if we have good drugs, then yes, we could use those. If we have a vaccine, then yes, but I don't think we have those in the next uh, uh, six months or something or, or so. So I think the public health measures are the only way we can move forward and fight this, this, this epidemic. 
Absolutely. Um, Dr. Mohammed Khalifa, as well as Dr. Ishraq Awad, have asked a similar question. Um, it's regarding the herd immunity idea. Um, so is it a gamble or would it be actually true to follow the herd immunity idea on the basis that the virus, the virus will not mutate too, too much? Or is it actually a very too early for this management strategy as we don't know much about this virus? So the question about the herd immunity is, this is a school of thought, school of thoughts that says you let the virus spread, so people will become immune, they're going to get herd immunity, and that's how you, you fight the virus. But as I said in one of my slides, the price is high. If more people are going to, more people are going to get sick, they will need treatment, ICU, and so on. So the price is 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 is, is going to be high. But there is a school of thought which says yes you don't you don't uh, you you let you let the virus especially among young people who are at less at risk of, of 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 complications to get infected uh, so you can build up the herd immunity and and, and 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 then protect other people in the community but the price could be very high and that's why most of the countries are are, are, are implementing harsh measures of isolation and, 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 and lockdown and so on. Thank you. Dr. Lamia Hassan has asked, despite lockdown measures, the curve has not flattened and cases are still peaking. Is there a specific reason for this? Because the, 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 the issue which I mentioned is, first of all, in the United Kingdom, are we yet to implement the measures of, of, of uh, lockdown and so on? Uh, are we led that a lot of people now are infected, especially asymptomatically or very mild symptoms, and they are spreading the infection? And I think that's, that's what's happening. I think there are a lot of people here uh, uh, who are mildly infected or, or asymptomatically infected, and they're just uh, uh, spreading the virus. And I think that's, 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 that's why that's happening. And that, as I said, could be, could be because the UK was very late to implement the, 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 the public health measures which has which needed to be done early on. Thank you. Dr. Tariq Abdullah has asked, why has the number of those recovered in the UK relatively small and far lower than European countries? Is it because we are just under-reporting or does it advan uh, reflect advances in treatment in other countries? Uh, I think there is an element of under-reporting uh, of the recovered uh, people. I think people in, in England here, they are mainly interested in the number of infected and the numbers who are sick and, and, and so on. So there is under-reporting. Uh, uh, and I think also the, the if you look at the care, it started, it started only from mid-March. So people take a while to recover completely from this, from this especially people who end up in ITU and so on. So it takes a while. So to get the data properly, it will take time to get the, the, the proper data about the people who recover. But there is an element of under-reporting also, definitely. He has also asked, is um, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin used in the UK? There is, it is used in trials only, uh, just like Dr. Hamoun mentioned. They are only used here in the United Kingdom in trials. So there is a big trial now, multi-centered trial in the United Kingdom, uh, which is looks at, 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 at um, hydroxychloroquine, looking at uh, calitra, looking at uh, um, uh, hydro hydrocortisone. I think it's four of, four arms or five arms, I can't remember. And they are just looking, at, they, they're looking into that. So we just have to wait and see what the outcome of those trials is. Okay. Um, Dr. Ala Al-Malik has asked about a German study that's been published in the news recently about high antibody titer in non-infective healthy carriers. Would you be able to comment on that? Yes. I mean, this is what I suspect, as I said, happening that I think there are a lot of people uh, uh, in the community who are, I suspect, have been infected, but they have a very mild infection or asymptomatic infection. Uh, the, the problem we're having here is that we don't have a good serological test yet to do that sort of work. But there is a, a study, I think, which is 
then in the blood transfusion center in Oxford, which is going to be published in the next few days. And it says that they looked at the uh, blood donors, and I think they found maybe about 18% of people who are antibody positive. But um, I, don't, I haven't seen the, 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 the study in details, but I think uh, it's, they say 18%, but whether how good the assays they use and so on, I can't comment on that. But I think they found about two, up to 20% of people or blood donors are seropositive. Thank you very much, Dr. Hassan, for answering all the questions. We'll now move the question panel to Dr. Ibrahim Hassan, please. Yes. Um, thank you. Our first question is from Dr. Ahmed Saadeddin about the role of steroids um, in ICU management of COVID patients. Uh, very good question. Um, I think, again, is the evolving science we are learning, um, and there's a lot of randomized trials that's running at the moment. Uh, the recommendation for now, until we have more data, is to really use it in the right setup. Uh, and the right setup is really when you get cytokine storm. Um, that will be applied not only for steroid, but also for immune modulator uh, to decrease um, uh, the inflammation. Uh, other than that, there is really no data. It's um, a delay, the uh, presence of the virus in the body. Um, and can lead to um, another complication. So the recommendation would be really in this group of patients uh, that have an inflammatory storm to try to control uh, the inflammation. Thank you. Um, he also asked about do not resuscitate directives with patients with high risk of mortality. How do you find that in your practice? It's a... Uh, it's, uh, it's an ethical dilemma. Uh, we have a team working on the ethical principle um, during the pandemic and epidemic. Uh, it's important to associate that with your phase of the epidemic because in the beginning of the epidemic, when you have a lot of resources, you really have to uh, treat uh, people, uh, you know, ethically uh, appropriate. Um, but again, uh, that has to be clarified. If you have someone who is 90 years old who is bedridden, uh, would you do a recitation for this patient? That's a big challenge. Uh, but if it comes to a 40-year-old uh, who is very sick with multi-organ support, would you treat or will you, you will not treat? This is all dependent on the resources and the availability of the equipment. If you run out of everything, what are you going to do? Uh, so it's, uh, it's vary from a country to a country based on the resources. And more importantly, in the phase of the epidemic, uh, if, it's, uh, if it's in the peak and uh, you exceeded your capacity, you have to target your treatment to the people who will benefit the most. Uh, it's a bit difficult, but this is exactly what happened in a war. When you are in a war zone and you have a lot of casualties, you will really look for the people that you can save. Some you will not be able to save. I hope we never reach this stage, inshallah. Uh, but this is, has to be really uh, assessed in this context. Uh, we cannot generalize. Um, it has to be assessed in the, in the phase of the epidemic and whether you exceeded your capacity or not. Thank you. Dr. Rawi Ahmed had asked, has asked, any experience in proning non-ventilated patients? Can this delay ventilation or help reducing oxygen requirements? Absolutely, yes. Um, so um, in our center, we've done that uh, for many, many, actually, for a long time. Um, and now the data and evidence is worldwide. Many, many uh, top centers utilizing prone uh, ventilation strategy uh, way ahead up of, uh, of intubation, and uh, many of these patients will improve uh, without the requirement of uh, mechanical ventilation. So this is something, um, if, if, if something you need to train uh, is a prone position ventilation. This is really save lives. Uh, I think um, for every ICU, uh, this is something uh, we have to utilize more and more. Uh, in Qatar, we have a very big team who are doing training everywhere uh, on prone position ventilation. Uh, and it's very, very effective. Uh, decrease the need for um, rescue therapies remarkably, whether it's an intubation or ECMO and other. So something that we will definitely echo or will uh, recommend highly from position. Thank you. This is very vital advice. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Baha al-Din Osman has asked about the role of ECMO in the treatment of COVID-19 critical patients. It's, uh, it's my area of expertise. Uh, so I'm the chair, um, past chair actually, for, uh, for ECMO in Asia and Africa uh, for last year. Um, and it's, um, it's, it's the thing that I love the most. Um, it requires a lot of resources. 
ECMO play a very important role in COVID, um, uh, whether it's like myocarditis and cytokine storm or severe respiratory failure who is not responsive uh, to uh, mechanical ventilation. Uh, the reason I did not mention ECMO because I know uh, it doesn't exist in Sudan yet. Uh, the first case was done uh, by our team. Uh, I was there and we retrieved this patient to Qatar. Um, uh, so I knew the technology is not available. That's why I didn't want to touch uh, about it. It requires a lot of resources. And again, you know, it's all dependent on the phase of the pandemic and epidemic, uh, whether you can. Uh, if you if you have a choice, you have a two clinician uh, and you have two patients, one who requires just simple intubation, one who need ECMO or five who need intubation with one team. Uh, the same team will treat only one patient in ECMO, which, which, one, which way you will go. So it depends on your resources, but uh, should ECMO be included in the management? Absolutely, yes, because it's actually um, very effective and it can treat so many uh, patients who will uh, fail in mechanical ventilation, uh, cytokine storm, who otherwise will die. Um, but again, this will come to their ethical principle. Did you increase your capacity? Do you have resources? Do you have a trained team? Uh, alhamdulillah, we have it here in Qatar. I hope in Sudan it will be available. In UK, I'm sure they have it. Uh, but it's something that's very powerful, uh, but it needs a lot of resources. Thank you. Our last question is about ventilator settings by Dr. M.O.B. Um, he's mentioned that high pressure is not usually a good plan. Do you mean high MAP or high PIP or high PEEP? And is volume a guarantee as an option in adults? Uh, when we talk about uh, high pressure, um, he seems like a, an, a, an a intensivist uh, or have a good intensive care knowledge. Um, we apply it to a PEEP number one and then the driving pressure. The pressure, not the MIP. We don't, uh, very few people now look to the mean airway pressure. We look to the driving pressure and to the PEEP. Uh, some of the lung, uh, in usual ARDS, you have cystic depivity, you give them a higher P, if you put them in ABRV mode or, or a high driving pressure mode, uh, that will help uh, these ones. Other group of patients, it will not, uh, especially if um, they are, their problem is not in the lung parenchyma. It's a microthrombi, it's a vasculopathy, it's a, um, you know, other related uh, issue that uh, worse the VQ mismatch, higher pressure is not going to help, it only can cause uh, complication. So, and I, I've seen another question talking about uh, can this lead to complication? Absolutely. You know, if you ventilate uh, people in the wrong way with uh, uh, not tailored to their need, uh, it can cause a lot of problems and can kill people. Uh, and we hear this in the news and the report that all oh, mechanical ventilation can kill. Yes, it can kill if you do it wrongly. That's why you need to train people. Uh, and that's why there is a specialty called intensive care that people go through it and they understand how to ventilate patients. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Ibra Ibrahim, for answering these questions. I will now um, hand the microphone to Dr. Mohammed Jamal to address the remaining questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, okay, thanks, Shaza. Um, the next few questions will be to Dr. Maida. Dr. Maida, are you available? Okay, while well, we wait for Dr. Maida, uh, there's a question maybe to Dr. Ibrahim uh, first around. Um, so there's a question from uh, Dr. Hala Abuzay, um, um who's an intensive uh, care consultant. Um, pragmatically, how can we help Sudan now by getting the critical care network up and running? You know, this is, uh, this is uh, the question in the heart of the problem. And uh, to me, I, I, I run the critical care network in Qatar for a long time, um, and it takes uh, a lot of effort. Um, and it's something that needs to be, um, you know, Sudan is much bigger, obviously, than Qatar. Um, there are so many different hospitals. I think that something has to be started ACP by the Ministry of Health or the leaders of critical care in Qatar. They need to come together. Um, and analyze all the ICU within the country, you know, get all the directors, even do a Zoom meeting, yeah, put a strategy. Uh, what is the manpower that's available in the whole country for critical care? Yeah? What is the capability of training, doing online training of people within critical care or non-critical care? 
Um, yeah, what's the equipment? We need to have the list of all the equipment in the country and where to do uh, resources. You will be surprised. Some of the hospitals will have ventilators that they are not using and others are overwhelmed. So this distribution of the resources within the country is essential because you will be very surprised of number of equipment or medical staff who are available and they are not participating and other areas is really overwhelmed. So this is the time to pull this together and to pull it, I think it's the Ministry of Health have to initiate this, they have to appoint a lead uh, and the lead need to bring people together um, and streamline the, the workforce. Uh, otherwise, you will, not, you will not be able to fight. Uh, you have to think about it as an army, you know, you are deploying an army, you know, train your people in different grades. Uh, you can deploy even medical students and nursing students to this workforce, train them quickly, do induction. Uh, I'm happy to assist if anyone asks me for help, I would be delighted to help. And um, uh, it's uh, just um, uh, it's something, it just needs to be initiated. I cannot initiate it from here. Hello? Uh, but Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can, yeah. Hello? Okay, sorry, sorry. Just, uh, so it's, uh, <laughs> it's a question in the heart of the problem because the work is the, is the team who's going to fight this when it comes to the hospital. If it doesn't come, it's all the preventive measure, but the IC team will get the, they will get the heat. Okay, thanks very much for your answer. Um, uh, Dr. Maida, uh, are you available? Yeah? Yes, yes. Okay, so there's a, a, a couple of questions for you. Uh, first question is from Dr. Hisham al Um How can Sudan bring pressure on the international community to relax monetary transactions to help us fund in the local response? I really don't know. I think uh, there, ha there has been a lot of pressure from people to to the government to just ease the, the, the means of, uh, of uh, you know, receiving money from, uh, from abroad. I, I don't know really what is the problem. Um, and I'm sorry, I, they, once they, I think they declare that Bank of Khartoum is ready to accept. Uh, people can transfer to the Bank of Khartoum, but it was, I don't think it is happening. Okay. Uh, so, um, so another question is from Dr. Sarah um, about the role of WHO in supporting um, low resources uh, set in PPE. You know, there are there are a lot of donations coming in from uh, from UNICEF. From I think UNICEF now is in charge of the emergency uh, funds. And then there are very uh, important local efforts. Uh, the group of doc lady doctors who were able to, you know, uh, find the material and actually they are trying to manufacture it in, in Sudan. Um, there are a lot of uh, 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 people in diaspora sending shipping, and I think they. Some of these things are, are arriving uh, or, or have already uh, been received in Sudan. But uh, the demand is high, and uh, I think uh, there are so many efforts to, to get more of these protective uh, equipment. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Obviously, that's a question that concerns a lot of uh, healthcare workers in Sudan uh, regarding PPE. Um, I'm just moving to Dr. Hassan next. Um, Dr. Hassan, are you available? Yes. Yeah, okay. So I think this question has been asked in a different way earlier, but so the question is from Dr. Heisen. Uh, do you agree that the low number of cases in Sudan could be possibly due to low number of tested cases? Yes, that could be. Uh, that could be a factor uh, because I know there is a very small number of uh, tests that have been going on in Khartoum right now um, and we don't know what's happening in the, uh, in the other parts of the country there is no testing at all so yes that's why I'm saying it the, the, the people shouldn't just uh, believe that the, the, the this belt zone and, and, and the protection and so on I don't think that's that's the case I think people should be very uh, should be clear that this is not 
it should be um, very clear that this is not the case and look for cases and, 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 and be very open-minded about what's going on there. Right. Thanks very much. So the next question is from uh, Dr. Rashid Mekki. Um, he's asking about BCG vaccination, um, which is obviously a good number of people are vaccinated in Sudan. Mm. Um, any comments on that? Yes, as that's one of the things that have been mentioned, that there is a, risk, a link between people who are... Uh, one of the explanations that has been given about that zone, because people are mostly received BCG, and BCG could have providing some sort of community, or uh, the immune system is, is primed to, to deal with anything. I don't think there is enough evidence yet uh, to say that. It's just an observation. Uh, but I think we have to wait and see. I don't think there is enough evidence to support that yet. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Dr. Hisham al Kidder. He's, he's asking about children and, and why the clinical presentation is generally mild, um, if, if you have any thoughts about that. Um, we don't know. We don't know the answer to that. Uh, but we, 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 this is something we have been noticed. Just not just children, even young young adults, the 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 the, the, uh, the infection usually is mild or asymptomatic, uh, but in children it is more noticeable that there is very little going on in, 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 in chil among children. Um, we don't know that. We don't know the answer to that. I don't know the answer. Maybe um, some of the other speakers could have. Uh, but it has to do something to do with the immune system, of course. Uh, whether that the immune system in children is not mature enough to generate the, the kind of storm which everybody is talking about, uh, uh, that could be a factor. Uh, that's my own interpretation. So, I don't know if any of the speakers have got any other uh, explanation. Okay. Um, uh, for the sake of time, there's a lot of questions, so I'm just going to maybe pick another three, four questions, um, and then we'll conclude. Um, there's a question from um, someone um, which has came in as A. Um, this is a question for maybe uh, Dr. Abobaida. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, Dr. Hamura, are you around? Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So the question is, this is someone who's saying that um, as someone who's not from the medical field, I'm worried about how long this pandemic will last and how to keep safe mentally. Um, I think for, as a clinician that you have dealt with a good number of cases at this stage, um, what's your feeling around this? Uh, this is a difficult question to answer because it very much depends on how we respond to the pandemic as Dr. Anthony Fauci often answered this question. Uh, it, if we um, uh, stick with, uh, by the uh, social distancing and uh, uh, community measures that have been recommended, uh, then we could be uh, looking at months rather than uh, uh, years of uh, uh, of pandemic, but uh, uh, it, it's it's difficult to to know uh, for certain because um, it all depends on human behavior and how how people respond. And you we can see that how that is different from one country to another. The other factor that will determine the duration of this pandemic is obviously the discovery of, of an effective vaccine. We know that is not going to be possible for at least a year. Uh, so because if there is an effective vaccine, uh, then uh, that may uh, halt the uh, spread of the, of the virus. Uh, but we don't have that yet, and we're unlikely to have that uh, uh, this side of uh, uh, 2021. Um, the, so how people can stay uh, and maintain uh, their sanity uh, during this is uh, uh, by just really sticking with, with family, uh, uh, maintaining uh, a healthy lifestyle uh, to 
uh, make sure that people's uh, immunity is good, a healthy diet, uh, exercise, um, a good uh, number of uh, uh, hours of sleep, uh, minimum, a minimum of six hours of sleep, uh, get, uh, having enough, uh, drinking enough water or fluids in general, avoiding cigarette smoking, and alcohol, uh, and just maintaining uh, uh, good health and resorting to things that think, uh, one can enjoy doing in their in their uh, spare time, such as uh, uh, exercise or reading or. Uh, 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 Connecting with family and friends and so on. So uh, that is that is all uh, what we can do. But uh, in terms of uh, predictions, they are difficult to make, especially when they are about the future. <laughs> thanks, thanks very much. I, I hope in the next few forums we um, might be able to get someone as well who's a psychiatrist or a psychologist to help us um, ask such questions as well. Um, so uh, I'm just moving to the fair brain. Um, the fair brain. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I, I think there's a, there's about three or four questions all talking about non-invasive ventilation and um, the best time to start mechanical ventilation. So there's a question from uh, Dr. Nadim Medin about what's the best time to start mechanical ventilation, and a question from Dr. Lyadris about whether we could use CPAP and high flow nasal oxygen as a holding measure to spare the ICU capacity. This is obviously very, very good questions, and uh, the recommendation keep changing, and it's, uh, it's mostly dependent on the resources uh, that are uh, available uh, in the country, in the hospital. Um, so briefly, uh, non-invasive ventilation, um, it does improve uh, oxygenation. Uh, the risk of NIV in severe pneumonia is most patients who comes into the intensive care with severe pneumonia, uh, NIV does not really prevent them from intubation. So it just delay intubation and uh, uh, increase risk of uh, healthcare professional uh, of infection. Uh, CPAP and NIV is very good in pulmonary edema and other uh, very mild uh, cases of pneumonia. They can uh, be tolerated. So in, in, in our system uh, at the moment, you know, again, there is no really uh, clear guidelines depending on resources and the phase of the epidemic. So uh, in our system at the moment, we said, you know, uh, we don't want to take any risk of a healthcare provider because we have a limited staff um, and we're still early in the pandemic. Uh, so we took approaches uh, early intubation. Uh, we will not uh, spend time in NIV. Uh, we will go for flow flow, uh, nasal cannulas uh, to intubation. Um, other countries uh, who got hit hard, they changed their protocol, especially in Italy and England. Uh, they said, you know what, this number is massive, so we cannot really intubate everybody uh, because this is also have a risk. Uh, so they start to study what is the best approach. Uh, so NIV in negative pressure room or area that can be safe for, uh, for the healthcare provider to provide this treatment is, is, is reasonable. High flow nasal cannula have a problem because it consumes a lot of oxygen. And if you use it in so many patients, you can consume your oxygen resources in the hospital. And we already have uh, cases of uh, uh, a near shutdown of the, insula, uh, of the oxygen resource in uh, some of the hospital in the chest where they just ran out of, uh, of oxygen. So it carries this burden because it works with a very high flow, 60 liters per minute and, and, and others. So it's a pretty high uh, flow. So to summarize the answer for that would be, depending on your resources, can you use NIV? Absolutely, you can, uh, but you have to be careful with your staff um, and do not delay intubation. So if they don't improve quickly, move to the intubation. Um, I think that cannula probably uh, can be used, but not in, so, in uh, big numbers uh, because it will uh, affect uh, the, the, the oxygen re uh, reservoir in the hospital. Uh, so that's about that question. Um, actually, I answered both of the questions at the same time today because it's uh, NIV and high flow nasal cannula. So I yeah, that, that's that's very helpful. I think we're just running over time, so there's uh, a last question. Um, and Sarah, I'll, I'll direct this question to you because you'll um, you'll be best to answer this, and also because you'll be taken over to conclude. Um, Khalid Nasr is asking, how can this forum help setting hospitals ready in Sudan? 
Okay, uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think this forum is one of the tools that we um, can help. Uh, there's a lot of effort um, by Sudanese inside Sudan, and we have to salute them for the in, 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 tremendous work they have done uh, on the ground and protocols, um, and the effort of the Ministry of Health and the specialist um, sort of um, uh, groups. Um, as well as the diaspora, um, not only by funding, uh, but as well logistics, ideas, uh, debate, and this is the, uh, this forum is um, for this purpose. So we have, we'll try to have another session in about two weeks with different themes. We would hope that our colleagues uh, from Sudan will join uh, to share um, um, the protocols, the ideas, and what they would like us to um, help with. This was just like a tester so that we all uh, meet. Uh, we have to remember as well that the support is for all Sudanese diaspora all over the world. We are all facing this problem. Uh, before, when we talk about cholera outbreak, at that time we were not facing the same pandemic. Now we are all um, you know, on the same shoes, whatever um, the facilities. Um, I would like um, uh, to thank um, the uh, assets um, team for their effort and patience and uh, the distinguished speakers who participated today uh, with us, for all of you who have uh, attended and for the valuable questions and the answers and for my colleague Shaza and Mohammed and uh, we hope we will arrange another uh, webinar in about two weeks time that will be led by uh, Mr. Ala al Malik from um, SDU Canada. So, uh, as you sorry, Australia and New Zealand. Um, so, thank you, everybody, and stay safe. And the last message, as Dr. Marabeda said, uh, prevention uh, is the main uh, step for dealing with this uh, pandemic. Thank you very much.